A cube map is a special kind of texture that's generated by taking six images of our scene from the same fixed position, but in six different directions. First front, then 90 degrees to the left and right, 180 degrees to the back, and 90 degrees up to top and 90 degrees down to bottom. The field of view for each of these images is 90 degrees both horizontally and vertically, and so we effectively get an image of our scene in all directions from that point. These six images are then stitched together into a single texture, usually in the cross pattern you see here. With these cube maps, we can render a few interesting effects, most notably skyboxes and environment mapping. Example 6.1 demonstrates a skybox. What you see here is we're rendering this ordinary textured box uh, at the center of the scene just for visual reference so that as I move around, you can tell that I'm moving. As I translate around, you can see that I'm effectively moving around the box, but we also are rendering the skybox, and notice that the skybox rendering in the background, that only changes when I rotate my camera, not when I translate. As I translate left and right here, the skybox image is not changing. Also notice that the skybox, uh, despite being rendered from a cube map, which was captured as six discrete images, you can't really see the seams between the edges, and you can't really detect where the corners are, even if I look straight at where the corner should be. If we placed our camera inside a cube and rendered those six images onto the faces of the cube, we would look like we're inside a box. And yet you can see here, it doesn't really look like we're inside a box. What accounts for this is the special way in which cube maps are sampled. When we sample from a cube map, rather than providing a U and V coordinate, we provide a three-dimensional vector coordinate, an X, Y, and Z. And from this vector, it's computed first which face we are sampling from and then the corresponding UV coordinate for that face is computed. So what this looks like in detail is, given a vector, we select the corresponding image from the six images. We then compute a texture chord on that face that ranges from negative one to positive one, but because UV coordinates are supposed to be expressed in the scale from zero to one, we then rescale from zero to one. Say the vector we want to sample is running through the front image plane and assume also we're in a left-handed system, unlike OpenGL, and so Z in the positive direction runs through the front. Well then, the way we know that our vector runs through the front image plane is that at first Z is going to be greater than zero, it's going to be positive, but that alone is not enough. That just tells us that it can't possibly be the back plane. It could still be the left, right, top, and bottom. What tells us it's the front is that the absolute value of X is less than Z, and the absolute value of Y is less than Z because remember that the field of view for these images is 90 degrees on both axes. And so say when X is equal to Z, then we have a vector running through the right edge of the front image. If negative X is equal to Z, then we're running through the left edge of the front image. And so the X's that range from negative Z to positive Z, those X coordinates lie in the range of the front image rather than the left or right image. And then it's the same logic for the Y's. For Y values between negative Z and positive Z, those Y's are in the range of the front image rather than the bottom or top image. So these are the criteria that tells us that our vector runs through the front image plane. To calculate U and V in terms of a range negative one to positive one, that's simply the ratio of X over Z and Y over Z. And then we rescale by adding one and dividing by two, getting us UV coordinates in the range of zero to one. Now for vectors running through the right image plane, it's all the same logic, except the axes are just swapping roles here. And so now the test that tells us that we're on the right image plane is that, well, X is going to be greater than zero, the absolute value of Z is less than X, and the absolute value of Y is less than X. And then to compute U's and V's, the ratio is negative Z over X for U and Y over X for V. Again, exact same logic, you just have to reorient for the different axes. And then considering one more case, the left image plane is all the same as for the right image plane, except we just flip the signs of the X's. So this is the logic. From here, you can figure out for yourself how to compute vectors running through the top, bottom, and back images. So now, when we render our skybox, what we wanna do is keep our camera positioned at the origin, but we'll let our camera rotate so we can look around. And everywhere we look, we want to render a pixel, so there should be some primitive in the way. It doesn't actually really matter what primitive we see, might as well be triangles, and it doesn't matter really what the geometry is. It just has to block our view everywhere we look. And so the simplest possible geometry that would entirely encompass our camera is a cube. But be clear, the fact that our cube map is captured as a cube and that we're rendering onto a cube, that is actually 
coincidental. What matters is that for every point on the primitives we render, what we want for each pixel is the corresponding world space coordinate, because any coordinate can also be thought of as a vector. And so for each pixel, we sample from the cube map using that pixel's world space vector. And so the fragment shader for our skybox will look very simple. We get as input a VEC3 texture coordinate, not a VEC2, because this is not just a UV value, this is an XYZ world space vector. And our sampler notice is now a sampler cube, not a sampler 2D. But we use the same texture function to sample from it, and that gets us our fragment color. To get this input texture coordinate in the vertex shader, we simply take the vertex and get its world space coordinate. So we transform it by the model matrix. Though actually this isn't really gonna be necessary because our skybox cube that we're rendering onto, it's not actually gonna get transformed. Model here is just going to be an identity matrix because the local chords are one and the same with the world space chords in this case. So we actually could just assign a pause directly to text chords here. Anyway, geo position is gonna be computed like normal except for one thing. Because our skybox is supposed to be rendered behind everything else, well, we could simply just render it first and then render everything on top. But then for every pixel we overwrite, that's overdraw, that's, that's wasted work where we drew the skybox where it didn't really need to be drawn. And so we can do a little trick where we render the skybox last, but make sure for the Z depth test, every pixel of the skybox has the Z value one, the max Z depth value. And as you'll see, we'll tweak the depth test so that rather than testing for whether the Z value is less than the current Z value in the buffer, it's gonna be less than or equals. And so effectively, our skybox is going to be drawn into all those pixels where the Z buffer currently has the value one, but not into any other pixels, which are the pixels where something else has already been drawn. And so effectively then, the fragment shader for our skybox is only going to run for those pixels where there isn't already anything drawn, thus saving the wasted work if we drew it to every pixel and then drew the rest of the scene on top. So the way to make sure that the Z value in screen space where the depth test is performed to make sure that Z value is always one for our skybox pixels, we set the Z value in clip space to be the same as the W because then when the vertices are converted into normalized device coordinates, X, Y, and Z are all divided by W. And so if Z equals W, the Z value is always going to end up being one. W divided by W is always going to be one. So having computed the position like normal, if we get dot X, Y, W, W, then geo position Z's will be the same values as the W's. Anyway, now we have our text chords and our geo positions. And remember that our vertex output of text chords here in the fragment shader is gonna get interpolated for each pixel, but in the perspective correct way. And that will get us for each pixel the correct world space vector. So now in the C++ code, we have the vertices of our cube, the one that we actually see at the center of the scene, not the skybox. But then we also have the skybox cube vertices. Notice that the dimensions are effectively two on each side. That doesn't actually really matter. As long as it's big enough that our camera doesn't clip into it, it doesn't really matter what the size is. It could be much larger or even smaller. It does not really matter. But anyway, in our render loop, we're gonna first draw the cube and then draw the skybox. But when we draw the skybox, all the Z depth values are going to be equal to one. And we want our skybox to overwrite pixels that also have the value one. So we need to change the depth test function from the default of less than to less than or equal. Also notice when we get the view transform, we don't want our camera to translate at all. And so we're taking the mat four, converting it to mat three that effectively drops the right column and the bottom row. And then we convert it back to a mat four. Note though that this code all looks the same as up here, except notice we set the depth test function back to less, the default, for the sake of drawing our cube in the next frame. And also our texture is not a texture 2D as normal, it's a texture cube map. And the way that's getting created is down here in the load cube map function. Our cube map on disk actually is stored as six separate images. Looking at the director here, you can see back, bottom, front, left, right, and top. So those are all getting loaded separately in this loop here. Notice the currently bound texture is a cube map texture, not a regular texture 2D. And when we call text image 2D to load the data from the file into the texture, this first constant parameter here is specifying which of the faces this texture corresponds to. 
The positive x constant refers to the right face. Negative x refers to the left. Positive z to the front, negative z to the back, positive y to the top, and negative y to the bottom. And conveniently, these constants are defined as incremented numbers. So in our loop here, we can change the constant by just adding an i, the counter of the loop. And so, for example, in the second iteration, the number is going to be equivalent to the negative x constant. The faces, by the way, are constructed here and then passed into load q maps. So it's first right, left, top, bottom, front, then back. And lastly, when we set the texture parameters, Notice that we have three texture wrap parameters, S, T, and R, because for our cube maps, we have three texture coordinates, not the usual two. The next example, 6.2, demonstrates the other primary use of cube maps, environment mapping. What's happening here is that the cube at the center of our scene is now being textured with the same cube map as our skybox, but for each pixel, the vector is computed as the reflection of the vector from the camera to the point. So in effect, it looks like a reflection of the environment. Now, of course, because the environment that it reflects was captured as a still image, our environment map reflection won't reflect anything that changes or anything else that's rendered in the scene. But it still is a useful technique because it is the cheapest way to compute a reflective surface. In this example, we have a totally reflective surface. We have a perfect mirror, but more commonly, these environment maps are applied for less shiny materials, like say metal armor or statues, in which case the cube map texture is then blended with some base color of the material itself. And so you get a duller reflection effect. And so in practice, when the reflections aren't perfect, it's really not all that noticeable. Anyway, what this now looks like in code is on the C++ side, hardly anything has changed. It's just that now for the cube we're rendering at the center of the scene, it doesn't have UV coordinates. It now has normals because we're going to compute a reflected angle off the surface. And so in the vertex shader, we need to transform these normals according to the formula we saw in earlier examples. We also want the world space position and then GL position is computed like normal. Then in the fragment shader, I here is going to be the vector from the camera to the point on the surface. And then we reflect that off the surface using the normalized normal to get R. And that is what we sample from the cube map texture. Note that this reflection to be perfectly accurate would have to account for the fact that the position is not at the point where the environment map was captured. And so the vector we get is not exactly correct. But as long as the things reflected in the environment map aren't too close, if they're a reasonable distance away, then the inaccuracy is not usually noticeable.